Well, good morning, Millwood. It's good seeing everybody here this morning. We have a few uh, announcements for today. Tonight at 6 p.m. for our evening service, we're going to begin a uh, study through the book of James. I was supposed to begin last week, but as you know, the snow, uh, the snow had different plans. So that study through the book of James actually begins tonight. And then on Wednesday nights, we're talking uh, through the book of tactics, watching the videos there. And it's how do you discuss your Christian convictions with non-Christians. February 18th at 5 p.m., there's going to be uh, a game night here. Everyone's welcome. Bring finger foods to share and your favorite game. And then February 25th, a week after the Men and Boys Wild Game Feast in Beverly, Ohio, Dave Jones, the preacher here, is going to be the speaker. Uh, so you can sign up for that back on the bulletin board, and usually a few of us leave from here to go down there. So if you're worried about a ride, don't worry about it. As you know, today is our Impact Sunday where our goal is to focus on the youth and help them through the different issues that they go along with as well as help the parents who are raising the youth here so that together we can collectively impact our culture for Jesus Christ. And uh, I got a card here, Anthony Odu, one of the, the kids that graduated from Millwood uh, last year, has made the dean list. So if you can continue to pray for him. And all things we do here at Millwood, uh, that's the right spirit. <laughs> uh, with all things we do here at Millwood, um, Christian excellence is a huge priority. Doing things that bring glory to God and doing them well, uh, as well as we can. And, and Anthony is an outstanding man, and we have several um, in our youth and several beyond, and, and not even in our youth yet, who are uh, excellent and displaying Christ's character. And this is going to be a great opportunity for him and so many others after him to represent the church here, most importantly, represent their Savior and Lord. We have a card here from Mary Ellen McDonald. Church family, thank you so much for your prayers, the beautiful flowers and cards and visits. I am getting stronger each day. God bless you. And as you know, she had a fall and has been fighting some of the, the issues with recovery with that. So if you can continue to keep the, her in prayers and uh, visit her and help her through that process, I know she would appreciate it. If you would stand with me this morning, I'm going to be reading from Matthew 28, the Great Commission. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Pray with me, if you would. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the God that you are. I ask that you be with every person here. Uh, bless them. Uh, and all the trials they might be going through, watch over them and, and take care of them. And God, to help us to be the solution to their problems as a church. Help us point one another closer to your son, closer to your heart, and closer to heaven every day. Help us to love one another as you love the church. And, and all things help us to bring glory to you inside these walls and outside them. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. To be free from a burden of sin There's power in the blood Power in the blood Would you worry for a victory There's wonderful power in the blood There is power, power Wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb There is power, power Wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's time. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be with us, wider than snow? There's power in the blood. 
blood, power in the blood. Since it's a loss, it is in living flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working now in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working now in the precious blood of the Lamb. Be seen.
Good morning. What a blessing it is to be able to sing praises and hymn to God. It was beautiful. Um, I would like to ask at this time, if, if we don't mind, if we could just focus our attention over to the cross that's hanging on the wall above the baptistry and, and just kind of keep our attention and our focus in that direction. Um, in Matthew, we were told to go and to make disciples in all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I would like to ask, who are we willing to bleed for? Forgiveness, forgiveness is not a feeling, but it is what makes us victorious. In Acts 20, we are told to keep watch over ourselves, the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made us overseers. We are to be shepherds of the church of God, which Jesus has bought with his own blood. Peace comes through the shed blood of Jesus. Without bloodshed, there is no forgiveness. And the blood of Jesus will purify us from sin. And we are only made holy through the blood of Christ. You see, there is power. There is power in the blood of Jesus. It is the soul cleansing life that comes through the blood of Jesus. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying that this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. The fruit of the vine, the juice that we use, it represents the blood of Jesus. And it is one of two ways that we have the opportunity to be into contact with the blood of Jesus. And that is in the Last Supper and then also through baptism. At one time, Peggy Johnson, that used to sit with us each Sunday morning, explained to me how grape juice is much like our blood. That in the making of jelly, you have to add pectin to hold the cell structure together to make a perfect jelly. But that pectin is a natural substance in the plant materials of grapes that allows it to set up just like how our blood has a type of cell structure that makes it set up and clot. In Revelation 1, it explains that Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler and king of the earth, to him who loves us, freed us from our sin by his blood. Life only comes through blood, the blood of Jesus. His suffering and his bloodshed is so that we can have forgiveness and an understanding of how much he really does love us. So do we love each other? Do we love each other as Christ loves us? Are we willing to pick up our cross daily and love each other? Are we willing to bleed for each other? 
In Philippians chapter 2, we are told, we are told that in our lives, we must think and we must act like Jesus. You see, Christ himself was like God in everything. But he did not think that being equal with God was something that he would ever use to his own advantage. Let us pray. Our Father God, Lord, um, we are so grateful and undeserving of your grace and your love. There is such great power there, Father God, that just fills our hearts with joy. And just help us to understand that, that forgiveness isn't a filling, Lord, but that through your forgiveness we are truly victorious. And it, it is a gift that you've given us that, uh, that we just pray that we can just set feelings aside and, and share that gift, Lord, that you give to us. We're so thankful for what you've done on that cross, Father, Lord. Let us just use that to propel us forward with, with motivation and action for you, Father God. Lord, we love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Well, good morning, church. 
want to invite all of our elementary, junior high, and high school students to stand up right now. If you're in school still, stand up and make your way back to Zach. Have fun herding the cats. If you are visiting with us, I know Zach mentioned it earlier, but this is a Sunday we've set aside. We call it Impact Sunday. We want to have an impact on our community, and, and one of the key aspects of our community is young people. We've got a very multi-generational congregation here, and part of that life in our church is the, is the young people, and uh, I really appreciate that. Zach really just has a heart to reach these children for the Lord. And we have a youth group every Sunday evening at 6 o'clock. I would invite you to bring your junior and senior high students for youth group. And I think the philosophy here behind Impact Sunday was if they won't come to youth group, he's going to bring youth group to them. And so today they're going to have a wonderful experience at the other end of the building. Uh, Some activities, but also learning about Jesus, just like we're going to do down here. And that's really what it's all about for all of us. This morning we want to look into an account from the Gospel of Luke chapter 5, and it's a it's really a, a, an incredible story of, of young men that love people. And uh, there's an individual that we'll learn about today who had never walked, as far as we know. He'd been crippled, perhaps since birth, or maybe as a very young child, had an accident occur to him, and he just could not use his legs. And in their culture, and at that time, they didn't have the modern resources that we have, where a child could have a wheelchair, even a, even a an electronic wheelchair to carry him about the village where he might have lived. And so if he wanted to go anywhere, he either had to scratch and crawl to make it there or have his friends carry him. And that's our story today, a story about four men probably, maybe two of his best friends that he grew up with and maybe two of his brothers that he lived with. They played in the same neighborhood. They ran together, together for their whole lives. And all he wanted was to be healed. Isn't that what anybody really wants when they're going through difficult times in their lives, to have the problem fixed? He couldn't walk, and chances are his family had invested most of what they had to pay pay doctors and buy potions to try to discern what they could do to help their son maybe one day just move a little bit, but nothing ever seemed to work. Well, the word was spreading about a, a man, a miracle worker, Jesus, who had been throughout their area teaching the truth of God's Word, but also healing people. And when they discovered that he had set up shop and that his home base was going to be their very own village of Capernaum, his best friends had the greatest idea in the world. Let's get him to Jesus. And so with all they had and with every effort they could make, they made their way to the place where they knew Jesus would be preaching and healing people that day. Luke starts the account this way in Luke 5, starting in verse 17. Luke 5, 17. One day, he, Jesus, was teaching in Capernaum, where some Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there also. They had come from every village of Galilee and of Judea, from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. And some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were trying to bring him in and to set him down in front of Jesus. Jesus' reputation obviously had grown day after day as he had performed the miracles that he had performed throughout Judea. His teaching was called teaching with authority in a way they'd never heard anybody teach before. And so between his teachings of the coming of the kingdom of God and the miraculous ability that he had, he would draw people by the thousands. And on this particular day, they all descended upon a house somewhere in Capernaum to hear what Jesus had to say and maybe get healed themselves. And so when these friends had heard that the miracle worker Jesus himself was in town, whatever the cost... Whatever the time commitment, no matter how hard it would be, they were going to get their friend to Jesus, even if it meant carrying his bed through town and getting him at the feet of Christ. That's what we do, isn't it? That's what we do when there's people in our lives that we love and they need answers and they need help and they need direction and they need Jesus. Whatever the cost, no matter how hard it is, we want to get the people we love to Jesus because Jesus changes lives. When you encounter Jesus, you're not going to leave the same person that you were when he showed up. Today, as we conclude this series we've been doing 
called impact. I want us to think in terms of our obligation to our children and our grandchildren, to our elementary students and to our teenagers, to those that are not yet born and still in their mother's womb, to those that are now crawling and walking around in the nursery this very morning. We are here as a church to partner with you, parents and grandparents. We are here to help you as you seek to disciple your children. That is your obligation to train up your child in the way he should go. But we believe that God has given us a unique ability in this setting to help you in doing that along the way. That's why Zach and Emily have come alongside us to work with our youth and to minister to them. And so we want to help you do the heavy lifting of raising godly children. And ultimately, as a church, we want to have an impact for Jesus in our community. And what that requires is that we get the next generation to Jesus. Just like these friends did whatever they could to get this young crippled man to Jesus, we want to do everything we can to get that next generation to Jesus. And let me tell you what, and I don't really even need to tell you this, we have our work cut out for us, don't we? Whatever might have crippled that boy thousands of years ago, we know that we live in a culture that is crippling our children as it relates to their orientation or their viewpoint of who God is and who they can be in Christ Jesus. There are many of us in this room that can remember when the Twin Towers were were still standing in New York City. And for those of us that remember those days and the times before We look back on our childhood and being raised in the homes where we were raised and going to the schools where we went. And and the biggest problems in our lives back then were getting our homework done on time and preparing for tests, maybe dealing with a bully bully at school who might want to take our our lunch money or who we were going to ask to homecoming, whether we were going to make the basketball team or not. And let's just be honest. We didn't live in Mayberry and life isn't always better then than it is now. But I will say this, I think growing up in America in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and into the 90s was a lot easier than what the kids at the other end of this building are dealing with every single day of their lives. And so I think it's important that we have a perspective, not just that Culture and society are so bad, but that culture and society are doing everything they can to cripple our children from gaining access to Jesus Christ. We know what children today are dealing with. If you were to take a survey of of young people that were born after the Twin Towers came down, the number one issue that, that is on their minds today, honestly, is climate change. They're struggling with trying to understand gender roles. And they're trying to understand where the place of biblical morality fits in a culture that long ago gave up on God. We live in a culture today that that has normalized immorality and everything is sexualized. And as older folks, the old people in the place today, we get that. But on a more personal level for these young ones... They're struggling with things like their image on social media. Now, for the the majority of us, we're like, oh, my, 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 what a waste of time. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, that's just silliness. For them, what they look like on Instagram or TikTok is as important as what you looked like, ladies, when you went to your senior prom. That image that you and I tried to present as young people to our friends in the schools, that's the image that they're trying to come to terms with in their own lives as well. And so it may seem trivial to us, but if you recall, adults, when you were a teenager, there was nothing trivial. Everything was a big deal. And in that way, they are just like we are, and we have to be aware of that. And so this crippled man in the Bible, 
We really don't know his full backstory, why he was crippled or how long he had been crippled, the efforts that his family took to help him throughout the course of his life, what costs they expended to get him to doctors and and others that might be able to help him. All we really know is this, that he was crippled and that his posse, these friends of his, knew they had to get him to Jesus at at whatever cost there may be. And when we think about our culture pressing down on the church, pressing down on Christian families, and pressing down on our young people, we have to keep in mind that we have to do everything in our power to get them to Jesus. You see, when adults just give in or give up, we can't be surprised when that next generation is crippled and they can't find their way to Jesus. But that's not us, is it? That's not you. You made a a very determined decision to be here today. For most of you, you make that decision every week. In fact, it's such a decision in your life, it's not even something you think about anymore. But you have made a very determined decision to make sure that you were here on this day, on this Impact Sunday, so that your children would have an edge up maybe a better understanding on how they, can, how they can interact with this culture that is pressing against them each and every moment of their lives. But we could blame the world all we want, church, and we do like to do that. But not only is culture crippling them, there are obstacles along the way that they have to face and deal with. Let's look at The scripture again, starting in verse 18, and we'll go into verse 19. And some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were trying to bring him in and to set him down in front of Jesus. But not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof. And so the crowd is in and around the house. No matter what size the house might have been, the crowd was much bigger than the house. And so this small entourage of people that had come to bring their friend to Jesus have to find an alternative way to get them to the Savior. And so I think most of us here would understand that when we're talking about the rooftops in Palestine or Judea at that time, they're not like our shingled and peaked roofs that we have today. Their homes would have been flat-roofed. They would have had roofs where they could go up on the roof to enjoy the cool of the day, and in some cases, in the hottest days of summer, to go up on the roof to sleep. It would have been a place where they would assemble as people, and so the roof itself was a structure that could hold people. It was actually an outdoor room for them, like maybe we have a deck on the back of our houses. And that roof, just like the rest of the house, would have been made of things like uh, Leftover stone from another building project and mud and and chaff from the fields and grass and, and bits and pieces of wood wherever they could find it in the construction of their homes. And so when they arrive on the roof, their intent is still to get their friend down to Jesus, but they've got a problem at this point. There's a roof between them and Jesus. And that roof that is made of of brick and stone and rubble and wood and mud. It's something that would require a shovel to go through, but they didn't think they'd have to go to the roof today. They thought they were just going to Jesus, and so they get down on their hands and their knees, and they're scraping and digging with their fingernails. My guess is the crippled boy that was with them, the young man that had never perhaps walked in his life, is laying off the edge of his bed with his fingers digging into the dirt because he realizes in this moment in his life, the only hope he has, in fact, the only hope he'll ever have to walk again is below him, Jesus. And so everything they did, they strained, they pulled at the wood, they pulled at the stones, they pulled at the the mud, they broke their fingernails doing whatever they could to get their friend to Jesus, the healer. And they didn't care what obstacles were in the way. And so when it comes to us and that next generation, the people that are assembled at the other end of the building, that all of us love with our hearts and our minds, our souls, we want the best for those young people that are down there. We can blame the culture, but let's just get honest. We can get in the way too. And it's interesting, when we look at this account in the Scriptures, who was closest to Jesus? 
Who were the people that were crowding in? Who were the ones that didn't care who was coming up from the backside? It was probably the most faithful followers of Jesus who followed him from town to town looking for what they could get out of their relationship with Jesus Christ. And I think when we think about the obstacles that are in the way of our young people often, we have to look at the church first. Let judgment begin with the household of God. And so I wonder at times, preacher included and very guilty, if I have honored tradition more than I have honored truth, if I have honored legalism more than I have honored love. And while I may say I want to do Bible things in Bible ways, there's plenty of traditions that we have accumulated over the years that sometimes can get in the way of young people coming to Jesus Christ. And it's not necessarily anything too complex. Sometimes it's our seats. I'm not giving up my seat. I've sat here ever since we moved into this building, and I'm not sitting anywhere else. And so when I envision these men on this bed, I mean, these guys are struggling. They're struggling. They're sweating, they're dirty, they're filthy. They've walked through town, they've battled the crowds to get as close as they could to Jesus. And when they arrive at the house, it is packed with people. And just like the Red Sea split on that day when the Israel exodus from uh, Egypt, my expectation would be that those who love God the most would get out of the way and make sure as many people could get to Christ as easily as they possibly could. And so we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing that might get in the way of young people coming to Jesus Christ? And we have identified some things over time, and I'm grateful for the love and grace that this church has shown. Is we have made some very positive changes to make this place more welcoming for younger people. It's been said before that the church is one generation away from dying. And if we don't pass on the faith to that next generation, what's going to be left? Doesn't it thrill your soul, though, as you look around this room and you see a lot of people that are older? And earlier, as you looked in the row next to them, it might have been their children and their children's children, and in some cases, their children's children's children. The scripture in Deuteronomy 4.9 reminds us that we do have an obligation to teach our children the truth, but we also have an obligation to teach our children's children the truth, to pass on a heritage from the Lord, to raise up children that just don't go to church when they're adults or don't just bring their own kids to church, but they love Jesus with their whole hearts and they're seeking to disciple their friends and their neighbors and their loved ones. And they're doing all they can to get others as close to Jesus as they possibly could. So church, let's make sure that we never block the way to Jesus because of our own unwillingness to move in our opinions when the scripture speaks that we need to do everything we can, as the apostle Paul says, to win people to Jesus Christ. But there's another obstacle in the way for our young people. And most of the time, it's us as parents. I think there's some obvious things that we could point to. You know, all of us as parents could probably say there's certain things we do that we shouldn't do that aren't good examples. Maybe the way we live isn't good. Maybe the uh, culture in which we spend time with our friends that aren't healthy for us isn't a good influence on our kids. We can look at ourselves and say, yeah, I could have done so much more to bring my children to Jesus. Maybe sometimes that obstacle for our kids isn't so much that we're living in a bad way, that we're living in an unhealthy way, that we're living in a moral lifestyle. Sometimes we're an obstacle to our kids in getting to Jesus just by our very indifference. Yeah, we'll go if if we got time. We'll pray if we don't forget. I'll get you to youth group if I feel like it. Our indifference can be the greatest obstacle in our children's lives. But we want to be intentional, right? We don't want to be indifferent. We want to motivate our kids to live good lives, to live fruitful lives, but most importantly, to live Christian lives. And so that's the obvious thing of how we can get in the way of our children. I think there's some not so obvious ways that we get in the way of our children getting to Jesus too. 
things that aren't inherently harmful and can actually be beneficial in their own way. And there's a long list of those. These are my three, top three, that get in the way of parents bringing their kids to Jesus Christ. And I don't just mean bringing them to church. Don't take anything I mean here that we're just getting kids to church. We want to get them to Jesus so they grow up and serve him the rest of their lives. So what are those top three things, I think, the obstacles that we can unintentionally put in the way of our children getting to Jesus? Number one, cell phones. Cell phones are an incredible thing. They're so beneficial. If, if, if they need to get a hold of us, if they need to get directions, if they need to contact somebody, if they want to send a message, if they want to look up a map to a restaurant, what, I mean, cell phones are amazing and we're, we're blessed by it. But parents, what I have seen is that we will put cell phones in the hands of 13-year-olds and younger, and within a click or two of their thumb, they're looking at things on their cell phone that nobody should be looking at, (laughs) whether they're 13 or 93. And so cell phones can be one of those things that if we leave them unmonitored in that way, that could be very dangerous. I really appreciate, I know at least one of our families in the church here always had a rule. Hey, no cell phones beyond the living room, right? You have to use the restroom, your cell phone stays out here. You're going to bed at night, your cell phone stays out here. You've got to put intentional patterns in your household that will prevent the dangers of our culture invading their phones. So I think that's the number... Number one thing. Number two, sports. Sports are incredibly beneficial, aren't they? A lot of you here are athletes. You grew up playing sports. You're a coach now. You, you want your children to play sports. And sports are probably the best way in our culture to develop teamwork, to help kids understand how to lead other people, how to exercise and self-discipline themselves, of course, But we fall into this trap in our culture where we want our kids to be involved in a team and we know that teams are important. But the next thing we find out is that our schedule is consumed by activity and running from this to that. And there's no time for family life. Except when we're in the car going through the McDonald's drive-thru on the way to the next game or the next practice. And that's if our kid is in the car with us and not on the bus with the team. And so... Most of us here that maybe are my age and older, you remember those days playing baseball and basketball where there was a season for everything. There was a minimal requirement for off-season activity and exercise and working out. Not that I ever did that. But when we approach these things that can be so beneficial, like sports, let's make sure we're approaching them with the eyes of Jesus. That the value we have is appropriate And that our number one concern is to get them to Jesus and not always make sure we get them to the game. And the third thing that I've observed, dating relationships and friendships for our kids very much can get in the way of their relationship or us getting them to Jesus. And I don't have to spend too much time there. We know that there are healthy relationships and there are unhealthy relationships. There are godly relationships and ungodly relationships. Whether it's in a dating situation or their friends, we want to make sure that our young people are connected with other young people who have the same motivations that they have, but more importantly, the same motivations that you have as a mom and dad getting to Jesus. And I think that's a good question for us as adults too. The people in our lives our friends, the people we spend time with, are they helping us get closer to Jesus or are they actually pulling us away from Jesus? You've got to make that determination. And let me say this, I'm not standing here as the legal authority, as, a, as an evangelist of the gospel of Jesus Christ, telling you that your kids can't own cell phones, they can't play sports, and they can't date until they're out of your house. Though I will say that, it's a lot easier if they date once they're out of your house than in your house. And I'm not an anti-everything guy, okay? I'm not an anti-everything guy. I just know that there's a good way to raise children, but there's a better way to raise children. 
And I haven't figured that better way out for the most part yet. We're still working on that. But I do know this, that better way takes intentionality, it takes hard work, and it takes sacrifice. And just like those friends on the rooftop who were clawing and fighting to get through that dirt roof, we have to claw and fight for every opportunity we can to do the better thing. And I think Andrea and I would be the first to tell you guys that we have made a lot of mistakes along the way. But the one thing perhaps that I've observed in the course of being a preacher and interacting with other families is that when adults are consumed with bringing the next generation to Jesus, not only is it the better way, it is the best way to be consumed with bringing the next generation to Jesus. And so church, parents, grandparents, let's be consumed with getting that generation to Jesus. Let's go back to the scripture. Again, we're going to start in verse 18. And some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were trying to bring him in and to set him down in front of Jesus. But not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down through the tiles with his stretcher into the middle of the crowd. And so they got him to Jesus. It worked. They got him to Jesus. Imagine this scene. Jesus is probably sitting in the middle of the room. People are intently listening. There are pre- people within inches of Jesus Uh, face, listening to what he has to say, and people are trying to to understand the truths of what he's uh, anticipating here, but but more importantly, they're probably all thinking, yeah, let's move on from the teaching and get to the miracles. And all of a sudden, a piece of rock hits somebody in the head, and then some dust comes down and lays on Jesus' brow. And then all of a sudden, wood crashes in, and people are thinking, the house is about to fall. And Jesus says, Calm down, I got this. And as people look up to see why the roof is coming in, they see a man on a stretcher being lowered down in front of the Savior. They got him to Jesus. And so now the anticipation has built. We are at the climax of this situation. Everything the friends had worked toward is now about to be accomplished. Everything that crippled man wanted will now be fulfilled. Everybody in the room all of a sudden understands there's a crippled dude. Jesus is about to heal him. And so everybody with just bated breath and attention is waiting for the miraculous moment. And then all of a sudden, as Jesus often does... He takes a left turn when everybody thought he was going to go right. Look at verse 20. Seeing their faith. Isn't that a powerful passage there? Isn't that amazing that the faith of other people can impact an individual like this? Right? I'm sure the guy on the mat had some faith, but Jesus says, the Scripture says, seeing their faith. Does Jesus see your faith as it relates to your kids? He can do incredible things with your children. If you lead the way with your faith. So Jesus, seeing their faith, said, Friend, your sins have been forgiven. And so as Jesus begins these words, people are probably thinking, Friend, stand up, you have been healed, would be what came out. But instead, he says, Your sins have been forgiven. It's one of those double take moments. Like, did you hear what he what did he say? We're not here about sin. This has nothing to do with spiritual stuff. We just want our buddy to walk. And you're worried about his heart, his sin, his eternity? Oh, come on. Wonderful lesson here. God's ways are not our ways. God does things in ways that we could never imagine. And God does not always give us what we want, but he will always give us what we need. And so Jesus heals what really needed to be fixed what the real problem in his eternity was, and that was his soul, his sins. Now, as a side note, this isn't teaching us that, that he was crippled because he was a sinner. Yeah, that's, that's not, don't make that connection here. I think what Jesus is acknowledging for all of us, that even this simple guy that was probably the most innocent boy in the neighborhood because he couldn't go out and get in trouble, the one everybody loved and rallied around, the mascot of the team, if you will, Sins? Him? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You see, in this situation, physical healing 
might have even been the better thing as people are looking at this. But really, Jesus takes care of the best thing, the need that all of us have, whether we can walk or not. Whether we're carrying our friend through town or we're the one on the mat, the best thing is everyone's real need, and that is forgiveness of sin. So Jesus could heal the body, and he'll get to that. But first, he's making a point here, I can heal the soul. And so when we look at our young people, our kids, our grandkids, the next generation coming along, is our priority for their lives, their souls? Or are we focused on the physical aspects of growing up in America? Getting good grades, making the team, having a good-looking boyfriend or girlfriend, going to a good college, making money, and providing for us in our retirement? Or are we really looking at where they're going to spend eternity? To be restored into a right relationship with God, that is why Jesus came into the world. Miracles, miracles are just a tool that Jesus used to draw attention and to prove that he was the Son of God. And so Jesus clears up the confusion in verse 24, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the, paraplegi- or to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your stretcher, and go home. You see, miracles aren't an end in and of themselves. You want healing? Okay, you can pray for healing. But ultimately, whether we survive one bout of heart disease or not, we're going to go to heaven or hell one day. And that's ultimately what matters. And what's the result? Verse 25, immediately he got up before them, picked up what he had been lying on, and went home glorifying God. So the roof shook in that moment. Can you imagine that? I mean, just for a moment, these guys are hot, sweaty, tired. Their fingers are hurting. They've developed calluses in the moment of an afternoon, just digging through the roof. They look down. They're disappointed initially in the, in the forgiveness of sins. And then Jesus says, get up and walk. And he takes his mat and walks back home. The roof shook. The house probably felt like it was going to come down. The celebration began. And I'll tell you what, once that boy was healed, everybody got out of the way, didn't they? It would have been much easier if they'd gotten out of the way when he first showed up for the guys on the roof. The crippled man was going home. But this time, he was walking there all by himself having an impact for Jesus in our community requires that we get the next generation to Jesus. So I want to challenge you. I hope you have a bulletin. If you don't have one, get one on your way out. There's three fundamental things that we need to understand when we hear the preaching of the gospel. Number one, how does it relate to what's going on in our head? How do I need to think differently? And that's something that you and your wife and maybe your extended family need to talk about. How do we need to think differently about getting our kids to Jesus from that point forward? Secondly, our hearts. How does it change our attitude? Maybe it changes our attitude and gives us a different perspective. Where we're like, you know, I, I want my kids to play sports. And there's a benefit in their, them playing sports. But you know what? We also need to have some balance in our lives. And so we're going we're gonna to try to evaluate how moving forward we can accomplish both things. Play sports and get them to Jesus. It can be done. And then our hands. This is maybe the most crucial question for us. What do I need to do now? And a very simple question as it applies to this passage. What does it mean to bring my children to Jesus? What does it mean for me to bring my children to Jesus? Does it mean that I'm going to make sure I'm at church every opportunity I have? Does it mean that we're going to read a chapter of the New Testament every night when we're done with supper? Does it mean we're going to pray together as a family every night before we go to bed? And ultimately, what it means for each and every one of us in this room is that we have a responsibility to disciple the next generation towards salvation and godly living. And so how does my life change from this moment forward so that I can disciple the next generation to Jesus? 
We want to have an impact for Jesus in our community, friends. And this means that we have to get the next generation to him, to Jesus. And we have our work cut out for us, don't we? The culture is crippling them. There are obstacles in the way. But you know what? We know how to get them to Jesus. We know how to get them to Jesus. We need to begin applying the process that is outlined in Scripture to do that. We need to rely upon one another to come around our families and to encourage each other in the faith and help mentor younger people into Jesus Christ. And if we have no clue how to do that, there are dozens of people in this room who have raised children that love Jesus Christ and are sitting at his feet this very moment, worshiping him with everything they are in their lives. And one day, moms and dads, Daughters and sons, grandmas and grandpas, friends and neighbors, we are going to worship in the presence of God Almighty in heaven at the feet of Jesus. And that's really what it is all about. So we know what to do. And my guess is you spend a little bit of time thinking about it, you know what to do and how to do it. Now we just got to do it, don't we? Put action into our hearts and our minds and begin moving forward to win the next generation to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, you are holy, you are mighty, you are capable beyond ourselves. And we cherish, Father, the opportunity to know Christ because it's only through Christ that we have redemption of sins, the forgiveness that we need. And Father, whether we are paralytics, whether we are infested with cancer, whether we have brain or heart disease, Father, whether we are going to die in 50 years or in five years, we do not know, but we do know this. There is life beyond this world, and Jesus Christ is the answer for eternity. Father, we have a choice now of where we go, and we have a choice to the best of our ability to get our children to heaven. Help us. Help us, God, to do that. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. I want to share with you a powerful quote. It's an old one, 200 years old, close to Charles Spurgeon said, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped around their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the sweat of our efforts and let no one go there unwarned and unprayed for. There's a roof. It's a barrier, whatever that looks like in your life, between your children and Jesus. And with all that I am and all that I desire, I want to get through that roof so I can make sure my kids, and to the best of my ability, help you get your kids to the feet of Jesus. Because only in Jesus do we find healing. And only in Jesus is there hope. And only in Jesus is heaven. And I believe that our efforts can help keep the next generation from going to hell. But more importantly, I believe that only Christ's work on the cross allows them to go to heaven. And that's got to be a decision they make. And we just have to do all we can to get them to Jesus. And so this morning, I want to challenge each and every one of us, whether you have children at home or not, whether you've been a parent or never have been a parent, whether you are hoping to be a parent or you're expecting in this very moment to be a parent soon. Make your number one priority to make sure that your kids get to Jesus. And if we're going to get them to Jesus, we've got to be there first, don't we? And so for those of us that are Christians... Perhaps we've allowed our faith to sort of take a back seat in our lives and grow in the shadows where it eventually dies. Let's make that commitment today to repent and to turn back to Christ and to live for him from this point on, to be at his feet as often as we can be. And for those that aren't Christians, to make a determination today to figure out what that means and how that happens. And that's why we exist, to bring people to Jesus. We're just friends on a rooftop digging through trying to get other people down to Jesus. And so we want to help you with that. And if you have questions about anything I've shared today or the Bible, we want to help you. And we have people equipped to study scriptures with you. 
And if you're ready today, if you've made that decision to turn away from a life of sin and to turn to Christ in baptism, we want to help you with that as well. And so we're going to stand and we're singing a song of invitation together. And if you're ready to make that response, we invite you to make it now. Amen. I I hope that you were blessed today, but more so, I hope that God was glorified in everything that we did, that our hearts and our minds are in tune with God more so now when we leave than maybe when we came in, as well as the work that he's asked us to do. And so just want to encourage you in that and remind you, uh, your young people are somewhere out there. Don't try to sneak out those doors. (laughs) Zach will find you. And we've got a lot of people helping down there today, and what a blessing that is for them. But we've been blessed by your presence and blessed by God. So let's pray. You here today? Father, I um, ask a special blessing on everyone that was here. Um, Be with them throughout the week and help spread the gospel, Father. And I pray this in your son's name. Amen. Like prisons that we couldn't escape, but he came.